Here we are. Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar hosted by BenQ. The topic of today is the post-production of a long exposure image and to be more specific, the one that you can see now on this chart. Well, but before to start, just a few words of introduction, of course. My name is Francesco Gola and um, I'm more than honored to be uh, here with you today. I'm a seascape photographer and uh, I travel around the world to capture the beauty of our coastlines. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and on many other platforms. So if at the end of this webinar you have still some question or if you want to go deeper into any of the discussed topic, please don't hesitate to contact me. Well, as you can see from this chart, I'm so blessed to be supported on my activities by some amazing photographic brands and BenQ is definitely one of those. So, well, um, if you already know me, it's not a surprise, uh, but if it's the first time that you hear my name, uh, I don't just like Seascape, actually, but I'm definitely in love with long exposures. On my website, uh, you can find all the images uh, that I captured during these years, uh, including the one that we are going to discuss today in uh, this uh, webinar. Um, apart... Uh, uh, let's say, apart from uh, traveling around the world, uh, I have a strong uh, commitment in teaching, actually. So I do both uh, uh, on-field activities, uh, so just long trips or just a uh, uh, few days uh, trips, let's say. And uh, I love also to do like online classes, like the one that you are attending right now. Of course, if you want to know more about that, what I do, please just uh, check my website that you can find here, or again, just drop me a message. But uh, let's talk about today, finally. So we have one hour to spend together that will split it in uh, 45 minutes of class and uh, 15 minutes uh, for your questions. So if you have uh, any question, just uh, write uh, in, the, in the panel that you have uh, with you. And uh, at the end, I will try to answer to all the questions. So the idea of this webinar is to show you how I usually post produce one of my image. And so we will go through uh, my workflow actually. Well, as the time is uh, a bit limited because it's just one hour, so well, let's say 45 minutes, uh, we can't go really deep in some topics, but I promise you that uh, we will touch everything from how to manage uh, the image inside a catalog till the, the final export. So um, before starting, just a few words about the gear that I'm going to use, both in terms of uh, hardware and software. So regarding the hardware, um, I think that two elements are quite mandatory. One uh, is the monitor and the other one is uh, the tool to profile it. Uh, regarding the monitor, right now I'm using a BenQ SW271 that is just epic for post-production thanks to the 4K resolution, wide gamut and color fidelity. But uh, we will discuss uh, later about why it's uh, so essential to have a good monitor. Uh, about the calibration tool, my choice uh, is the x uh, E1 uh, Display Pro. And, uh, well, you may ask why using these devices is considered essential by me. Well, in, in simple word, really simple word, is because without, uh, it's like post-producing uh, an image with sunglasses. So you're not, su you're not sure of uh, what you really have in front of you. Um, regarding software, we will use uh, Adobe Lightroom as primary post-production um, software. And then uh, we will use some specific tool. Uh, we will use um, Adobe Photoshop uh, and uh, a couple of plugins. One is called uh, Nick Collection that uh, you can find uh, also with the link uh, that I wrote here in this chart. And uh, the other one uh, is uh, TM panel that you can find on the other link. And uh, for uh, for this panel, we have uh, even a discount code that we you can read here if you're interested 
even later on purchasing it. Uh, the idea is to use Lightroom as, uh, again, a basic uh, tool to manage the picture and to do the basic adjustment, and then to move to this plugin to, to have uh, some more uh, advanced uh, um, local adjustment and to have uh, more control on our image. So it's finally time to start, and uh, let's move uh, to Adobe Lightroom then. So, of course, uh, I have already opened my Adobe Lightroom, and the image that we are going to play with uh, is already here loaded on, uh, on the catalog. Uh, the idea was to save as much time as possible, of course. So, uh, in any case, uh, you can see how I already I manage my images inside the catalog. Here, uh, now I am on the library module, and on the library model, I have all my collection of images. Uh, well, there are many, many different ways to catalog your image. And, um, well, uh, I prefer to catalog them according to the location. So, for example, inside one destination that could be Le Lofoten Island, I have uh, some sub collection with the name of the place that I specifically visited. So, it's super easy for me to find immediately the image I'm looking for. So for this webinar, I just created a temporary folder with a picture already loaded inside. But to import a picture is absolutely easy with Lightroom. You already know, you have just to press import to select the source and then uh, you have just to play with your image. So uh, let's check. Uh, a bit more about the image that we are going to play with. So I move to the developer module, and uh, uh, this is the image that uh, we are going to play with. So let's first analyze a bit everything. Um, as you can see, of course, it's a raw file, and uh, it was taken. It was a 30-second exposure, f11 ISO 64. So I try to. Um, to use these settings to, to capture this image with a dice lens. Um, so if you check already my histogram, you can see that uh, uh, I try to expose to the left uh, my image. Why to the left and not to the right as uh, most of uh, the books and websites suggest you to do? Well, the, the idea is that even if uh, your sensor is more sensitive on the right side of the histogram, so it collects more data here, it's a bit a problem to recover an image that is overexposed, while it's quite easy to recover an image that is underexposed. So here, the idea was to be able to capture this, uh, this image, so all the details inside this image, uh, without overexposing uh, the, this, the place where the sun was setting, that is here. Uh, so the risk of uh, exposing to the right is that you have everything perfectly exposed already in your image, but unfortunately with uh, an, uh, an overexposed area here in, uh, in the sun area. So um, the first thing I do is to press the J key. If I press the J key, as you can see, you see two small squares here on the top left and the top right of the histogram. And maybe I can see some strange overlay on my image, like, for example, this one. As you can see, it's a blue mark. And here I see a tiny red mark. What does it mean? Well, when you press the J key, basically, you can see which part of the images are uh, underexposed or overexposed. What does it mean? It means that if I'm going to print right now the image, all the pixel, all the part of the image that I see on blue will turn out on black. And all the part that are on red, they will turn out white in my print. So, of course, it's something that we need to keep in mind when, even when we select our picture among a selection, uh, among a group of picture, we need to find one that uh, is possible to be recovered. Well, ideally, without, uh, at the beginning, this mark. But uh, we will see together how we can get rid of them. So let's move on. And now we are going to apply, as I told you, some basic adjustment uh, using Lightroom 
um, well, I rearranged the user interface of Lightroom because uh, the one that was provided by Lightroom is, uh, is not so efficient for me. You can do uh, that simply pressing with the right mouse uh, on one of the box inside the develop module and then you can customize develop module. Uh, the first thing that I put uh, in my workflow, it was, uh, uh, it's the lens correction. So the first thing that I do is remove chromatic aberration and enable profile correction. As you can see, uh, the image looks already a bit different uh, because especially enabling the profile correction, you basically go to um, fix some distortion and some uh, light drop that you have in the corner of your image. Uh, usually uh, the camera, the, the lens uh, is already recognized by Lightroom here. Uh, it's uh, with the dice, uh, so the distagon, so it got really the, the lens that I'm uh, using. And, uh, uh, but uh, if uh, Lightroom is not able to find it, you can do manually. So no problem at all. Then we move to the second panel. That for me is the transform box. Actually, I don't use it very much because uh, it's more uh, used when you need to recover some straight line of a lighthouse or building. So basically you can make a distortion of your image well you need to be really careful because as you can see here when i distort my image maybe to recover a line i lose part of the image and so well uh, you need to think uh, twice before doing uh, a transformation when uh, it's not needed so for us uh, it's not needed so let's just move on and let's move to the real core of lightroom so it's the basic panel well, usually um, here people start to play with exposure, white balance, uh, and uh, well, they go from the top to the bottom of this panel. Well, I suggest you to do something a bit different. First of all, I will suggest you to try to use the profile section. Well, probably it's something that you don't even check when you post-produce your picture, but believe me, it's absolutely essential. So uh, what is the profile? Well, as usual, I will try to make it easy. So the main idea that you should keep in mind is that your raw file is not a real image, but is just a collection of data. With data, uh, I mean numerical data, and basically the file contains uh, this data for every single pixel that the sensor of your camera has. So to translate this pack of data into something that we can see, so in our image, we need a software like Adobe Lightroom, uh, Photoshop, that means Camera Raw, or Capture One, or any other post-production software. So the software has inside some algorithm in order to make this translation of raw data into an image. And part of this algorithm is the profile. So if we think of the algorithm as a translator, it's clear that if we change the translation service, we will change the result of the translation. So in our world, if we change the algorithm, we will change the aspect of the displayed image. Yes, that's really a key point. And I will show you some example. I'm moving from one profile to another one. Uh, it can dramatically change the result of your post-production because uh, changing the algorithm, you change the starting point of the post-production. So, um, how to choose the right profile? Well, there is no a right profile. There, there is the profile that suits most pictures. So, in this case, as we said before, uh, we need to try to recover as much as possible, probably, the, uh, this area of uh, uh, the sun that is setting behind these uh, hills. Actually, these are highlands. So, uh, what I do is just uh, to scroll one by one the profile to check uh, the profile that suits better the image. As you can see, when I change uh, the profile, also the area that were highlighted, maybe because they were overexposed, they may change. So from this profile that is Adobe Standard to Camera Landscape, they disappear. So actually I have an improvement of the image just changing the translation service, let's say. So, but of course you have to keep an eye on the uh, overall image because of course here I increase a lot the saturation and the, the um, 
the contrast in this image. But uh, well, here we have uh, another small problem. So how can, can we be sure to select the right one? Well, here is absolutely essential to have uh, a, a good monitor. And that's why I was talking about uh, my choice of the BenQ. So let's try to explain better this uh, key point of the monitor. And let's switch back for a second to our charts. So um, here I will try again to, to, um, to be absolutely uh, easy again, because uh, it's, not, it's a topic that usually lasts hours of explanation. So if you check this diagram, you can see uh, a thing that is called chromaticity diagram, that is, is this uh, colored mark, that basically is the representation of uh, the colors that our eyes can see. So if you keep, if you believe me and you keep this as a, uh, as the truth, I mean, uh, this is the chromaticity diagram and this is the maximum thing that the, your eyes can see, we can decompose our image into uh, every single pixel and we can place the pixel into this uh, diagram. So this is the image that we are playing with, exactly this image. So I translated this image uh, with a special software inside the chromaticity diagram. As you can see, the image is uh, all over here. And uh, the problem is that no monitor can cover the visible spectrum. So there is no way that we can see all uh, this uh, chromaticity diagram. But we need to use one, one monitor that cover as much as possible. So with uh, a, a regular monitor, let's say, uh, you see something that is not so far from uh, what is represented here by this triangle, that is the sRGB color space. So as you can see, a huge part of our image is outside the, the, the sRGB color space. And it means that if we check our image on a screen that is, not, uh, that is just able to, to see this uh, triangle, Actually, we, we miss a lot of information. And as you can see in this image, especially, most of the things outside of the triangle are in the yellow red area. So that is, uh, uh, that is this area, actually. So this could be a huge problem. So why is essential to use a, a, a wide gamut monitor? Because uh, with like a monitor like the, the BenQ SW271 that I'm using, we are able to uh, see all the colors that are inside this bigger triangle. And so, as you can see here, we have uh, much more pixel inside the triangle. And so we can see much more details. We can see much more column transition. And so we can choose properly the uh, profile. Of course, uh, this is not just uh, a matter of post-production, but will be absolutely essential also for printing because uh, uh, this monitor covers the 99% of the Adobe RGB color space. And so we, I'm sure that what I'm doing here is what I'm going to see in the final print. So let's move on and uh, let's say that for this image, I'm going to use the, uh, I don't know, let's try, I think that, well, this profile is very nice, is the camera standard. As you can see with this profile, I already removed all the red and dark blue overlay. So it means that if I print my image now, I can see details everywhere. Of course, we need to work still a lot on this image. And to do that, now I skip the exposure and contrast area and I start to work with highlight and shadow. Well, my main technique is to try to open first uh, the histogram. So I like to enlarge this histogram to, to gain more space on the right. And then I try to make some adjustment. To do that, uh, my, my technique is to bring the light back to minus 95. And so as you can see here, I'm already recovering a lot of details. Let's see before and after with minus 95. The shadow of plus 95. And then, as you can see, I see already much more details. 
uh, with the white and blacks uh, well i use different techniques uh, according to the image sometimes uh, i bring uh, the whites and the blacks really uh, to the edge of the um, of the highlights uh, and uh, or the overexposed and an overexposed area but in this case as the image is already pretty dark i think that i will keep the white almost uh, like uh, zero because i'm afraid that increasing too much the white I'm going to lose the details, as you can see here, in the color transition. And with the blacks, yes, I can play a bit, but my image is already pretty dark, and so I, want, I don't want to go too much to the dark side. So once uh, the histogram, let's say, is open, now I can try to move it playing a bit with exposure, for example. So I try to push the exposure a bit to the right. And maybe I can go even up to, let's say, plus 75, 0.75. As you can see, even if we expose to the left, we have an image that is uh, uh, all readable. Is We can read details in every single pixel of our image. And we didn't lose any transition in colors here. That's pretty amazing. So once the histogram is set to the center or where we want with the, the adjustment of the exposure, only at this moment I play with the temperature. So uh, the temperature is really something that, uh, uh, well, there is not a rule for the correct temperature, is the white doesn't exist basically. So you need to set a, a white point that you like. Here I remember that it was a really nice atmosphere and uh, it was a bit warmer than what I see now. So maybe I try to increase a bit the temperature. Maybe I will go even to 9,000, let's say 9,500, let's try. And then after I play with the temperature, I can even adjust a bit in the tint so before you play with the temperature and only after you play with the tint well uh, as i moved a bit the temperature to the right so to the warm probably i need to do a bit the same with the temperature but again is just up to your taste so for me is already great like this honestly well yes i really love it so now i move down here and i play with the presence Actually, I don't want to play neither with texture nor on clarity because if we play with this, uh, like say, mid frequency contrast, we are going to introduce some uh, um, extra sharpness in the water and we don't want to affect the water because actually the idea is to have a long exposure. So we will skip this uh, and we will play with the, the, um, the contrast uh, in the local adjustment. So. Uh, I play with vibrance and saturation, so to increase a bit uh, the, the colors. Well, forget about the saturation, because with the saturation you can just only destroy your image, as you can see here. Play it with the vibrance, because the vibrance is uh, an algorithm that play with the saturation, but it saturates only the color that are less vibrant. So usually I, I start from a plus 20, and then I check if it's fine or not. Well, already like that, the image, guys, is much better. I love it. But a great image is, by is made by details. So let's move uh, to the details. Uh, calibration is uh, mm, something that usually I don't touch. Maybe you can play a bit with the blue primary in saturation sometime when you have seascapes. If you want to increase a bit, you will see that all the color will be a bit more uh, oversaturated. But again, it's up to your taste. Usually, I forget about the tone curve because, uh, well, it's not so simple to use it in uh, Lightroom, so I forget about it. And then I play maybe with the HSL panel. Basically, I can control every single color channel in U, in saturation, and in luminance. Well, here you have to keep in mind that what you do here affect the wall image. So you need to be really uh, careful on selecting the action that you want to do in the wall image and uh, the, the ones that you want to um, apply only at local level. So the local level is something that we're going to 
later. So here, a trick that I suggest to you to do when you have a wonderful sunset, this is something really great in my opinion, is to go to the U and uh, to decrease a bit the yellow U, like something like even minus 40. Here you can recover a much more natural color transition because you are going to remove a bit of yellow that you have. Uh, well, you can even increase a bit the orange if you want, uh, in, in saturation maybe, and uh, even now the sunset looks much better. So let's check a before and after pressing here, before and after, and yes, well, the, the sunset looks already much better, and we didn't actually change the reality, honestly. Another trick is to play with the trees. Well, now the, the trees are a little bit blurry because uh, it was a windy evening, but I really love to have uh, windy back, well, greens and flowers and bushes or plants with wind because it gives some more uh, dynamic aspect to my image. Here, I suggest you maybe to decrease um, maybe a bit the luminance of the green. Let's do something like that. And maybe I would increase the saturation of the green. Let's do something like that. Uh, then if I look at my image, again, thinking about global adjustment, I see that uh, there is a bit of uh, purple tone in my image. And actually, I don't like it. So I go to the saturation. I check the purple channel. And I try maybe to reduce even at minus 50, something like that. So let's play with before and after, just playing a bit with the, the HSL panel, we recovered a lot in terms of quality in my image, I think. Yes, I really like it. So let's move down. And uh, usually the step after is to go to the detail. Well, even here we can spend really hours and hours uh, discussing about the sharpening. So my suggestion uh, to make a short, long story or a long, long story short, I don't know. Uh, in any case, so if you're going to print uh, this picture in terms of enlargement, so you're making this picture huge, uh, don't touch anything here. Even deactivate everything, set everything to zero. But uh, if you're just going to publish your image online or if you're going to print it in a regular size, I mean, you're not going to enlarge the image. My suggestion here is to increase the amount to 50. Oh, not definitely 150. And to do the same with the detail, leaving the radius to one. So let's magnify a bit. I really hope that you can see from the streaming. So this is the after and this is before. As you can see, I recover a lot in terms of sharpness without introducing any artifact. So this is a really a killer feature. The only thing that I suggest you to do is also masking. So pressing uh, Option or Alt if you are using a Windows computer, just press on the slider and drag it until you see the black on the water and the white on the ground. It means that you are applying this uh, sharpening only to the white, so only here in the, in, the for, in the background, in the foreground and in the middle ground, but you're not affecting the water. That should be as much silky as possible. So um, let's move on. And here we have uh, some uh, like effect like uh, vignetting, but this is something that we will discuss later in the finalization of image, like uh, uh, the discussion that we are going to have in cropping the image. So now we acted in our image in uh, local, in global terms. So what I did here affected the whole image, but we can also apply some adjustment in uh, in local way. So, I mean, I can fix some something in the image without affecting the whole image. So, one of the things that I can do here, for example, is of course to use the, oh, something is happening. Uh, no, I don't want it now. Um, is to use uh, the brushes. So brushes are a wonderful tool that uh, basically let you have uh, local adjustment in an easy way. To uh, use the brushes, you have to press the key K. 
or pressing here and you have this panel that uh, will come out then you press the o key and then uh, oh yes because uh, uh, pressing the o key let you see where you are let's say painting with the brush as you can see here i want to paint uh, this area and maybe even here so uh, having the o key let me really select accurately what i'm painting if i make a mistake i just press here erase and then i just clean a bit now i can't be so accurate because we are running out of time and so i press again the o key and here what i do for example is to recover the shadow of this part so i press here shadow and as you can see already my image looks much better because I recovered this area that were a bit underexposed. Perfect, I love them. Well, this is a super easy action, but we can do even um, more uh, accurate action. For example, I can recover uh, the, let's say here, let's try to work on this area. I press again, O. I paint these rocks because they look a bit bluish and then I can refine my selection with this tool the range mask tool with this tool I can pick for example the color range mask I press O key again to remove the red overlay I pick this selector and then I choose one of the rock that has uh, maybe some blue cast that I want to recover I press on it, I put back my picker, and then as you can see, the selection is already refined and I can refine it even more. More I drag to the left, less rocks are selected. I press O key again, and then I can play with this area. So for example, if I think that there is a blue cast here, what I want to do is maybe to desaturate the, the rocks. And this is absolutely easy to do. When I've done, I just press return and I'm ready to apply a new uh, selection. So let's make the last one here. For example, I want to have the water even more smooth. So I press the OK. I try to select the water in an accurate way. And this is definitely not an accurate way. So let's try to recover a bit with the arrays Tuck. again yes here you need to spend a bit of time on being accurate but we don't have time so uh, I just press OK key again and now for example uh, a thing that I suggest you to do is to play with the texture and to apply to the C a negative texture let's say even around minus 40, minus 50. So basically doing like that, we are able to make the water even more smoother. So we remove the crispy things in the water. Let's check the before and after. This is the before, focus here, for example. And this is the after. As you can see, is much more smoother, but in a super natural way. And uh, we spend like two minutes to do that. So that's great in my opinion. So once I'm done, actually I've completed, for example, what I can do here in Lightroom. Well, um, unfortunately Lightroom is good, but it's not extremely powerful. So if you want to um, to apply some more accurate uh, uh, local adjustment, I suggest you to use uh, a, a tool, a plugin suite that is called Nick Collection. So now I have already installed it in my laptop, of course. And to open it, I press on the right button and then edit in and I press on Viveza tool. That is the Nick tool that we are going to use. Uh, here, I need to make some selection on the um, file format. I want the, a TIFF file. Color space, uh, act of fate, guys, put Photo Pro RGB or Adobe RGB. Uh, basically, the idea is still this one. You need to work uh, in uh, a big 
color space. And then, uh, yes, if you choose Photo Pro, set 16-bit, uh, and then press Edit. So now my image is uh, imported into this new uh, tool, and we can play a bit more with local adjustment. So uh, Viveta is uh, great, and if you, in your mobile you are using the um, Google Snapseed, actually Google Snapseed is based on this technology. So it's uh, called U-Point technology, and basically you can create uh, some control point uh, instead with brushes, but uh, uh, using uh, circles. So basically I'm pressing here, uh, unfortunately here is in Italian because it's not possible to, trans, uh, to have the English localization because my operative system is in Italian. But you have just to press here and then you want, uh, if you want, for example, to have an adjustment uh, on uh, this rock, you have just to press uh, on it. When you press on it, you activate one control point. And when the control point is active, you can play with uh, different tools in a specific range. What is the range? The range is set by the first slider and I can increase or decrease the range. And basically my adjustment will affect all the point that have almost the same color of the pixel that I picked, that is shown here. Uh, so, uh, I will affect all the pixels of the same color in, the, in this circle. Well, not exactly in this circle, but inside this circle, they will have uh, the maximum effect. Outside the circle, uh, they will start to fade. You can see what you selected going here and pressing this. As you can see, now I selected basically the rock. If I want to be more focused on the rock, maybe I decrease a bit the circle. And then I apply my correction. So what is useful Nick for? For me, for two things. The first one is the rocks, are the rocks. I suggest you to play with the structure in the rock. So I usually increase up to plus 30, plus 35 the rocks in order to give some additional sharpness. And I do it in all the rocks that I want, keeping in mind the same rule. I'm going to affect only what I'm selecting. So here I do like that and like that. As you can see, you can reveal much more details. I can even copy with Control C and Control V or Command C and Control Command V. And basically I can continue to do that in all my image. Apart from the rocks, I suggest you to do uh, a bit of Viveza on the sky because you can recover the details in the sky. In the sky, I apply usually one or two control points. As you can see here, this is the color that is selected. And so, as you can see from here, is going to affect more the bluish color in the image and not the rocks that were more gray and dark. And here, what I do usually is to increase both the structure so plus 35, don't go mm, too much high with the structure, otherwise you can get some artifact. And then you move to the um, contrast. If you increase the contrast, you can increase the depth of the cloud. So I Command C and Command V, and I move my control point also in the other part of the image. I can see the before and after, and look, just from this to this, in less than five minutes and I'm running pretty fast because the time is a bit limited, but you can really spend hours here actually. So you can go on and when you are satisfied on what you did, you can press just save and your image will be automatically saved and placed inside your Lightroom catalog. Uh, and if you go to the library mode, you can see that you have now a copy of your image. So now we have this brand new image. Well, um, but it's not the end because we want to go deeper in the uh, local adjustment. And to do that, uh, we are going to use uh, a bit of Photoshop. And more specifically, we are going to use uh, tools like uh, Luminosity and uh, 
tonality mask. But to do that, let's first open our image inside light, inside the Photoshop. I press edit in Adobe Photoshop and uh, I confirm the first uh, selection. And now our image hopefully will be opened in Lightroom. Okay. I give the confirm to the uh, to the color profile selection and now we have our image inside Photoshop. So as I told you, we are going to use uh, luminosity and tonality mask. But uh, in few words, what is a luminosity mask or a tonality mask? Basically, they are really accurate selection of our image done according to specific criteria. Once the selection is done, we can address the specific adjustment just to these areas. So uh, we can create manually this mask, of course, and we did with Lightroom and in a sort of way with uh, Nick too, uh, but it's pretty complicated. And moreover, there are dozen and dozen of tools that can automate this uh, masking process. Well, sometimes these tools are just complicated because they include a lot of unnecessary for me features. And so for this reason, I suggest you to use the TM panel. That is the one that you can see here now and uh, you saw the link before. That is a perfect balance between the available function and the easy way to use it. So um, as you can see, basically here you can have, you can split, you can divide your image in uh, like 10 different luminosity level. So if I press one of this button, let's say uh, L3, I'm going to select just uh, a light, a portion of the image that is uh, bright in a certain way. So L3, that's just a level. And uh, if I press L4, I'm going to make the selection on the uh, image having even uh, less things selected because I'm going to select just the, the thing that are more bright. On the other way, I can do the same in, uh, in the dark area. So I can select, for example, the dark tree area. So it's going to select uh, just a part of my image. And if I go to dark five, it's going to select just uh, the super dark area on my image. So why this tool is so powerful? It's so powerful because you can make a selection that can't be absolutely made by hand, neither in Lightroom nor in uh, uh, Viveza. So in this image, what I use uh, the TM panel for is to try to remove, to get rid of this bluish cast inside the uh, the water, the foam of the water, because as you know, well, you expect to see white foam in your image. So uh, here I go to tonality instead of luminosity. And basically I have the chance not only to select the level of brightness that I want to select, but even uh, I can select if I want to pick only the, the warm tones, or the cold tones uh, inside a specific luminosity level. Well, it looks really complicated, guys, but it's so easy. So here, for example, uh, I want to select uh, this area. Well, it's a bright area and is a bit cold. So, for example, I try to press uh, cold light tree. If I press, uh, as you can see here, I already see a, a wonderful selection that I can even uh, refine a bit like that, I increase it a bit. And when I press OK, now I have to decide which kind of uh, adjustment I want to apply to this selection. And only to this selection, the adjustment will be applied. As I want to get rid of the blue cast, I press here. And so I'm going to create a level with the selection that I've done only for making adjustment in uh, uh, U and saturation. I can even refine the, the, the selection that I've done. For example, I press uh, option and I see what I've selected and I can remove part of the selection. For example, here, I don't want my selection 
I don't want to affect the sky with the adjustment that I'm going to do with the water. So I make a selection and then just press erase. And as you can see, I have black. Basically, where I have white, my adjustment will be set. Where I have dark, nothing will happen. Exactly like we saw before in uh, Viveta, but we are going to create the selection in just a different way with this super easy panel. So when I'm ready to make the, select, the, the adjustment, I just press here on the side of the mask that was created, double click, and then uh, a panel should come out here and I can play with the, the U and uh, saturation. So here to remove the cast, my suggestion is decrease the saturation, like even minus 70, minus 80, uh, really a lot, and increase a bit the brightness look at the effect. If we check the before and after, you can see that I removed the annoying blue cast. Of course, I'm going maybe to affect other areas, no problem. Again, I can play with the, my mask and I can refine the selection that I've done. Now we are not going to spend time on this because we are really at the end and I want to give you space for your questions. So um, now we have finalized our uh, post-production in terms of local adjustment. Now what I want to do is to refine my picture, so to finalize my picture. To do that, well, I can even stay here inside um, um, Photoshop well, the, what I usually do when I'm done with the, um, with the correction done with the TM panel is to uh, just to merge, uh, to flatten the image. So I put everything inside a single level. And then here you can refine uh, maybe with uh, some uh, specific adjustment uh, your image. For example, you can use, I don't know, we can remove this with the content aware tool, for example. I edit fill uh, content aware to remove this part of the image that is annoying. And of course, I don't feel guilty if I'm going to remove also this fence from the image. I'm sure that nobody will blame me for doing that. And you can do again with the content aware tool. Luckily, we have this fence near uh, something uh, that is easy to be reconstructed by the software. So just edit, fill, and again, uh, sorry, uh, content aware, I press okay. And as you can see, magic happens. So now it's absolutely perfect. Well, we can spend more and more time on this, but well, that's the moment to, uh, to go back uh, after the finalization to our Lightroom. To do that, I just, close basically uh, Photoshop and of course I press save to the adjustment that I've done. I go back to here we are back in Lightroom and as you can see I have my basically my third image with the adjustment that we did. Look here is absolutely perfect. Great actually much better than expected. So the last finalization that we can make here in my opinion, is about the composition. And so let's discuss about the cropping. Why I crop the image just at the end is because, uh, well, if you crop the image at the end, you can decide at the last minute of, the, of which part of the image you, can, you want to get rid of. If you crop your image at the beginning, the problem is that uh, maybe you are going to cut a part of the image that later during the post-production maybe you want to recover, and so it's too late. So here, maybe, I want to do something like that to get rid of this house. And here, maybe mm, I love to keep in mind that this is a leading line. So I want to get rid of this part. Maybe I crop a bit without uh, cutting here the heaven. When I'm satisfied, I press return. And this is my final image. Well, it's not that bad, honestly. Uh, I really like it. In, it's already sharp where it should be sharp. It's super soft where it's expected to be soft. 
And uh, well, really, we are almost at the end. But when is the real end of a post-production? Well, the real end is when you export your image for something. So let's discuss uh, about exporting the image. Well, you need to keep in mind just one thing. We must prepare the image for the specific destination. So what does I mean? Um, right now, your image is something like 7,000 pixel on the long edge, as you can see here. Well, the, when you scroll the wall on Facebook, the image that are displayed are at a really lower resolution. Let's say, let's say around 2,000 pixel on the long edge. So what happens if I post a 7,000 pixel image on Facebook? Well, simply Facebook will, realize, will resize this image and uh, will compress uh, the image to fit the 2,000 pixel. The problem is that doing that, basically Facebook uh, pull out one pixel from three of our image. This will result mainly into a drop of the sharpness of the image, because for sure the priority of Facebook is uh, uh, to resize the image uh, to reduce the size and not to keep the quality. So for this reason, it is absolutely mandatory that we prepare the image because if we control the resizing process, we can control the final quality of the image. Well, to do that, we can do both using Lightroom and Photoshop. Now, uh, we will do with Lightroom because it is uh, a bit uh, easier and faster. And because uh, well, at the end, uh, if you're going to post uh, on Facebook or on Instagram, well, the export on Lightroom is pretty fine. If you're going to export your image for printing, definitely don't use uh, Lightroom. Uh, we need to use uh, Photoshop for sure, but uh, it's not uh, the topic of this uh, webinar. So let's go, with, let's press with the right click on the image. Let's go to export and then export again. Well, here I have already some preset. So basically here you have an interface where you have different uh, options to select uh, from. So um, let's start from the beginning. Export location is up to you. Well, I put my images on desktop and uh, well, you can decide to rename or not your image. Well, let's say that we are not going to rename them. It's not a video, so it doesn't affect us. And this is the really the core area of uh, the export module in Lightroom. So the image format should be JPEG with the quality at 100%, so the maximum quality. Here is absolutely important. You need absolutely to select the color space to sRGB. Well, why you should put everything in sRGB if we discussed for an hour that we need to stay on a wide uh, uh, gamut, in a wide color space? Well, unfortunately, everything works fine until uh, you need to upload your image online because the standard for uh, uh, the visualization of internet unfortunately is sRGB so the again or you convert to the correct color space that in this case is sRGB or somebody will do it for you so it's better that you have the control of the conversion so you set color space now and of course you don't limit the size of your image in terms of sizing, the thing that you must do is to resize the image to fit the long edge. And for Facebook, I suggest you to set 2048 pixel. Well, this uh, should be the sweet spot in order to have the maximum, uh, um, let's say, uh, sharpness, the maximum quality inside uh, an image that you're going to upload uh, on Facebook. And if you check my images on Facebook, uh, I think that you can notice that they are pretty sharp. And again, this is not done for the webinar. This is really my workflow. So this is my preset. I do exactly like that. Regarding the sharpening, I suggest you, of course, to sharpen your image while you resize it for screen because you can even do for printing, so for paper, but it's not this the case. And uh, the amount is up to you. I suggest you to stay on standard, maybe try high, but in some really crispy image, maybe is too much. Regarding metadata, uh, up to you, watermark. I hate watermark, so I will suggest you to avoid. 
and uh, then we have just to press export. When we do that, what happens is that we have our image exported in the destination, that is the desktop in this case. And if we check the image with the preview, or let's open in a proper way the image, you can see that the image is absolutely sharp. I love it. And if I check the details of the image, we see that our image is uh, sized correctly, so 2048 pixel, and uh, uh, the, the size is just one megabyte, 1.5 megabyte. Of course, if you're going to upload a seven, nine megabyte image to Facebook, of course, Facebook, Facebook will compress your image. But if you keep your image small, uh, of course, you have good chances not to have any further compression. So, well, guys, uh, uh, we are at the end because uh, from the beginning, we convert, we post-produce our picture and we exported our image. So now is the moment for your question. We have, uh, well, around 10 minutes. I use five minutes more, but uh, we can try to spend a few minutes more on your uh, question. One last thing that I think is a good thing for you. Uh, the guys of BenQ are so kind to offer you the 10% off uh, on uh, the SW, PV and PD series monitor using the code that you can see here, but uh, don't worry because they will send you by, by mail after uh, the end of the, um, this webinar. And uh, yes, the only thing is valid just for one month from uh, I think tomorrow because tomorrow is the 25th, yes. Um, okay, so let's go to questions and let's check uh, if you have some question for me. So one, just one second because I need to open the screen with your questions. Uh, 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 okay, I'm going to uh, enlarge. Blah, blah, blah. Um, well, uh, I have a good question from Marilea that say, what subjects are good for long exposure? Uh, well, of course, for long exposure, you need uh, two elements. One element is something that is stay still and something else that is moving in order to create contrast. So if you check my picture, basically a long exposure, I think is good when you can see a contrast between something that is sharp and still like the rocks. That's why I wanted to recover the sharpness on the rock and something that is moving. So for me, seascapes are perfect because uh, more than the 60% of your image uh, contains uh, elements that are moving. So I have the, the sea, basically. Of course, mm, clouds are pretty important because they are moving too, hopefully. So it's good to have uh, more element like uh, as much as element uh, you you can have that are moving in in order to get a good uh, long exposure so let's go to the other question uh, okay more and more questions are coming so uh, 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 oh well how to get your signature blue cast in seascape raul well uh, honestly i don't know i don't have uh, a, a real answer to this question. Well, it's true. Most of my image has a sort of blue atmosphere. Well, what I can tell you, Raul, is that uh, is mostly achieved uh, selecting the white point uh, in the image. So if you follow the process that I show you, when uh, you first open the histogram and only after you play with the with the white balance you can really find a sweet spot in the white balance in order to have like the atmosphere that you want then of course my image are more oversaturated than uh, undersaturated but uh, that's a personal touch but for the temperature point uh, again uh, for the blue atmosphere let's say uh, the the white point uh, is absolutely essential so um, another question, what is the TM panel you use in Photoshop? 
uh, well, the TM panel, let's go back uh, here. Mm -mm. You can see it uh, from uh, this chart is the thing that you can see here. You can Google it, uh, but you will receive all this material for um, for uh, the present from thank you after this presentation. There is a website and there is even a discount code if you like it. Basically, the TM panel is a plugin for Photoshop that allowed me to make uh, luminosity and tonality mask. So the local adjustment, the super advanced local adjustment to have control of some real details on my image and uh, well having control in a super easy way um, is it possible to share the webinar recording video yes it will be shared with you guys so don't worry um, mm -mm, let's check for other questions if we have some uh, pa -pa -pa. Uh, well, there is a question. Okay, any recommendation to export the images for Instagram? Well, the Instagram works uh, almost uh, like uh, Photoshop, uh, sorry, almost like Facebook. So it uh, it compress and compress your image until they destroy it. So if you think at uh, the size of your screen for Facebook in your laptop and you think about the screen, in Instagram, uh, in your mobile, you can understand that they are going to compress even more the image. So for Instagram, I suggest you to resize your image up to 1080 pixels. So 1080, 1080. Uh, we have a question regarding uh, the difference between the slider and texture sharpen. I'm not sure I get the question. Uh, well, regarding the slider inside the Lightroom that control the contrast, uh, we have three different kind of contrast. One, let's say is called the low frequency contrast. That is the contrast that you can see here under exposure. It means that if I play with it here, you can see immediately the effect on the image. Uh, nine on 10, avoid to use this. Then you have the middle frequency um, sharpness uh, or contrast, sorry, that are controlled by the presence. So you have texture and clarity. If I play with this here, basically you don't see a lot of the effect like I did in, with the contrast. And here I suggest uh, to use it just with local brushes. So not in the global adjustment because you don't want to have the same effect on the old image. And um, then you have the high frequency contrast control that is made by the sharpening. Here, as you can see, if I play with it, you basically don't see anything unless you zoom in. Here, the suggestion is uh, avoid to play with it if you are going to enlarge your picture to print it. If you are going to use it for uh, just uh, for publishing your image online or for uh, doing something like, uh, I don't know, printing, but in a regular size, let's say on the printer size, maybe you can play a bit with it uh, using the settings that I discussed uh, during this webinar. Uh, how much time do you spend uh, in post-processing? Well, actually, I don't spend a lot of time because, as you can see, I don't use any advanced technique. My post-production is made by 90% of Lightroom, 8% of Viveza, and 2% of, um, of Photoshop. I really think that a good image is... Uh, taken on field, not on Photoshop. I mean, if you have the good light on field, then you can be sure that if you took a good picture, you will have a, a nice final image. But uh, if you take a bad image on the field, and then you think that with Photoshop, you can just add colors, light, uh, and things like that, well, 
probably is not uh, the way you are going to achieve a good picture. So if you take a good picture on the field, uh, you will uh, spend really like uh, 15, even 20 minutes for a post-production of a picture. Now it was a bit longer because I was discussing with you. Uh, of course, to take a good picture on the field, maybe you need uh, to help your camera, and uh, I mean in terms of dynamic range. So, for my camera, I'm using filters in front of the lens. I'm using different kind set of filter from uh, Nisi, and uh, I use uh, ND filters in order to extend the, um, the shutter speed, uh, graduated filter in order to balance the exposure between the sky and the rest of the scene, and uh, even polarizer in order to have a natural saturation and to remove reflection in the water. So I love to spend more time on the field than on uh, uh, my Photoshop or Lightroom. Uh, well, we have another question. Can you plan a webinar for printing image? Well, it's impossible to make a webinar on printing in just one hour, but maybe the guys at BenQ will be uh, interested in doing something, so why not? I don't see any other picture. Let's uh, any other question. Uh, do you use any other plugin of the Nick Collection Suite? Actually, yes, I use uh, also uh, Color FX Pro, but uh, really just uh, on one image every ten in order to to maybe to get some more silky effect. But, uh, well, the collection is a pretty huge collection of plugins, so you can spend hours on checking everything. Um, but let's see if we have anything else. Uh, can I apply the same workflow in Capture One? Uh, yes, the short answer is yes. The long answer is that uh, it doesn't matter the software that you're going to use, uh, it's a matter of attitude. So you need to find a workflow, so a sequence of action that you're going to do on your picture. So we started from global action, we moved to local adjustment, we went to tonality and luminosity mask, and we exported the image. Then, if you're using Lightroom, you're using Capture One, you're using uh, Photolab, you're using, uh, I don't know what, even GIMP, GIMP, I don't know, it's fine, because at the end, the only thing that matters is the workflow. And uh, that's why I wanted to focus on this aspect during this webinar. So, um, well, I think we are at the end of the question and at the end of the time. So, I want to really thank you guys for attending this webinar. From me is really everything. So, again, you're going to receive an email with, um, with all the information and uh, the discount code and even the link to download this, uh, the recording of this webinar. From Francesco Gola is everything. Thank you. And uh, I, hope you, I hope to see you on field, maybe somewhere uh, on a wonderful cliff on in front of a wonderful scenery like the one that you're seeing now from uh, your screen. So, ciao a tutti and buona serata.